the British Museum sits one of the last two copies of a pamphlet published in London in 1590. This publication is allegedly a translation of a similar tale that came out in Germany some years prior. It's a tale best left to campfire stories made up to scare the soul out of your friends, except it's not one taken out of Grimm's fairy tales. What makes this one more terrifying and disturbing is that it's supposedly the true account of a series of events that took place in Europe involving murder, cannibalism, torture, and downright evil. Is it the story of a deranged mind or something much more sinister and supernatural? This is the tale of the werewolf of Bedburg. Please be warned if you are faint of heart, you may want to stop here. The story I am about to tell you will have description of torture and violence against women and children. Let's revisit that pamphlet and its captivating headline. The Damnable Life and Death of Stuba, Peter. A Werewolf 1590. Well, hell on a tricycle. That is a bold statement. Here is what it had to say. Between 1564 and 1589, there was a spate of horrifying murders in the small village of Bedburg, Germany. The victims were left viciously torn to pieces and partially devoured. Others went missing and were never seen again. They were thought to have been eaten completely. Whatever was hunting and consuming them had left no evidence of their death, not even bones. Those crimes would eventually be connected to a man by the name of Peter Stubba. He was also known as Peter Stump, a name he collected after losing his left hand in an accident, leaving him with a stump in its place. Peter also went by other aliases such as Abel Griswold, although the reason for this is unclear. Stump was born in the small village of Eprath, near the town of Bedburg located in the northwestern portion of Germany. The details extracted about Stump's life comes largely from this 16-page pamphlet, also detailing his crimes and execution. Other than this, there has been very little historical evidence left of those events. Even the pamphlet, which was discovered by occultist Montague Summers in 1920, is considered a secondary source, being that it's only a translation of the original, which no longer exists. We therefore cannot assume that the tale was not embellished during the translation, or that facts were not left out with intent. For the sake of this video, we will rely heavily on what little we have been given by this, albeit lurid, account. Peter was known to be a wealthy farmer and father of two children, a daughter named Sybil and a son whose name is not mentioned. Peter's wealth made him well respected in his community. We can imagine Peter running for the position of town mayor and winning, but apparently he was hiding a dark secret from his fellow villagers. Peter had a penchant for human flesh. He had been dabbling in a little killing here and there, but had kept it mainly to the livestock. There had been a ration of animal mutilations in the area that had been mystifying to the locals. Cows were brutally torn open, their entrails eaten. Baby animals were particularly targeted for their soft flesh. Initially, wolves were of course blamed for the carnage, despite the strange nature of the killings. Peter was only practicing, as something much worse was to come. He was trying to satiate his bloodlust any way he could, but after a while he could no longer fight the urge for what he truly craved human flesh. Soon Peter skipped a few notches up the food chain. His fellow villagers became his target. Women and children started going missing only for their remains to be found brutally ravaged. Maybe Peter found them to be easy targets, but as we will soon find out, he had a much darker reasoning for his choice of prey. Back then, Peter's world was his menu when it came to having a slew of victims for his choosing. In 16th century Germany, Women and children more often than not found themselves in situations where they were alone and undefended from an attacker. They would tend to animals in the fields, go to the river to get water, wash their clothes or even venture deep in the forest for firewood. They would be all by their lonesome, and Peter apparently took full advantage of this. He would bludgeon the children, rip out their throats with his bare hands and eat their entrails. He even killed pregnant women and ate their unborn fetuses. He would later claim that they were like dainty morsels best agreeing to his appetite. Like a proper serial killer, Peter enjoyed going for walks in the village where he would greet the families of the victims he had just devoured. It was on those walks that he would also take great pleasure in choosing his next victim. He would apparently come up with devious plans to lure them from the safety of the village into wooded and remote areas where he would off them. Peter would get bolder as he would start to stretch his claws beyond women and children. There is even an account where he committed a triple murder, 
In this account, Peter came across a woman and two men taking a walk just outside the safety of the village walls. Peter quickly hid himself behind a thicket while calling out to one of the men by name. The man, thinking that someone he knew was in need of help, went to see who it was. As soon as he got closer and was out of sight of the others, Peter bashed his head in with a rock. Now the other two are waiting for him to return. When he doesn't, the second man goes looking for him and meets the same fate, leaving the woman by herself. Sounds familiar? Sensing that she was in mortal danger, she took off running. But no one, I mean no one, can outrun a werewolf. Peter soon caught up with her. After violating her, he proceeded to devour every bit of her up. During his trials, he went on to say that she was sweet and dainty in taste. Villagers would later find the bodies of the two men who were seemingly killed so Peter could get to the woman. Peter's killing rampage went on for a mind-boggling 25 years before fate caught up to him. In 1589, an incident took place that would bring the end to the terror that had been plaguing Bedburg for a quarter of a century. A group of children were playing in a meadow when a wolf slunked out of the woods and grabbed one of the girls by her collar. But her collar was so stiff that the wolf was unable to bite through it and had no choice but to let go and flee as the other children raised the alarm. But after body parts of more victims were discovered strewn about in the fields, the villagers had had enough. It was time to bring down the monster responsible for the terror cloaking the city. After spotting the wolf, a group of men chased after it with the help of their hunting dogs. After being tight on its heels, they finally have it cornered without any means of escape. To their shock and disbelief, instead of finding a wolf surrounded by their dogs, they discover Peter Stump standing there. The only reasoning they could come up with is that Peter is the beast. That he is a man able to transform into a wolf at will. Despite being a respected and well-liked figure, Peter was arrested and brought in front of the magistrate for trial. Stubba's trial took place in 1589. It secured its place in history as one of the most infamous werewolf trials to ever take place. Peter's confession was extracted under extreme pressure. He was strapped to a braking wheel and had his skin torn off in pieces by hot pincers. His limbs were shattered by the blunt end of an axe. Pushed to his limits, he admitted to the accusations thrown at him. Who wouldn't be under those circumstances? He claimed to have made a pact with the devil since he was 12 years old. He had not wanted wealth or status, but to have his wicked desires satiated. He'd traded his soul for the ability to transform into a wolf in order to kill and eat people. Peter proclaimed that the devil had gifted him a belt made out of wolf pelt. Apparently, this magical girdle granted him the ability to transform into a wolf when he placed it around his waist. The creature shifted into was described as having a mouth great and large, with most sharp cruel teeth, a large body, and mighty paws. Peter could just as easily take on his human form when he removed the belt from his waist. Compelled by Peter's claim, the magistrate sent men to search Peter's alleged haunts in search of this girdle. Their task was to find proof that would further corroborate Peter's story. But despite their best efforts, they came up empty-handed. It was rumored that the devil had taken his belt back because Peter got caught and was no longer worthy of such a gift. Peter confessed to killing 16 people two pregnant women and 14 children, one of which was his own son. He claimed to have lured his son into the forest, where he transformed into the beast and devoured the boy's brain. To make things worse, Peter even admitted to having an incestuous affair with his teenage daughter, Sybil, with whom he may have fathered a child. His mistress, Catherine Trompin, who was described as being tall and beautiful, was suspected of being a succubus sent to Peter by the devil itself. Both Sybil and Catherine eventually were accused of witchcraft and of being Peter's accomplices. They were sentenced to death by manner of flaying and strangulation. On October 31st, they were all executed in front of a crowd in the city square of Bedburg. Peter was beheaded, and his body was burnt alongside those of Sybil's and Catherine's. Except for his head. That was placed onto a stake and displayed as a strong message that witchcraft and consorting with the devil would not be tolerated. Bedberg had finally rid itself of its monster. But was Peter really a werewolf? What if he was actually innocent and only confessed under the duress of torture? It is not hard to imagine someone agreeing to all sorts of accusations, if it only means that in doing so, the pain they are enduring will stop. The context of the time plays a crucial role in understanding the case. 
the 16th century was a period marked by religious turmoil, particularly with the Protestant Reformation challenging the Catholic Church's authority. In this climate of fear and superstition, accusations of witchcraft and lycanthropy, werewolfism, were not uncommon. Peter Stump's case is thought by some historians to have been influenced by these religious tensions. It's suggested that Stump, a recent Protestant convert in a predominantly Catholic area, might have been an easy target for the community's fears and anxieties, making him a scapegoat for the unsolved crimes in Bedburg. After Peter's execution, there is no clear record of whether the killings in Bedburg continued or ceased, which further complicates the narrative. On one hand, the cessation of murders could imply his guilt. On the other, the fear and the spectacle of his public torture and execution could have served as a deterrent for any real perpetrator, assuming Peter was innocent.